comes out of the book of Isaiah, and I want to just take us, oops, I better turn this on, take us right into that. But um, I'm going to say something to you that you all know that we're the exit generation. And you all believe that? You know that, right? That's real true. That reality hasn't set in, quite honestly. We say that, but it hasn't set into this generation. Most of us don't know that. We don't know how to relate to it. We don't know how to connect to that. We don't know what to do. We don't even know what next day is. We just wake up realizing, hey, I gotta, I gotta get the, the grass cut again. You know, and uh, I gotta make it to work on time, or I gotta get this thing fixed, or you know, whatever the, the case may be. But there is no sense of urgency in this generation, yet this generation is assigned to something that no generation will follow and no generation before us had. And that is that in this generation, two billion people are going to die. They're going to be martyred for Christ. Two billion people. That's a population equal to all North America, Africa, and, um, and Europe. If you took all that, put it together, Africa, North America, and Europe, well, North America uh, is only about 380,000 380, in the U.S. alone. But when you put all that together, it doesn't even equal one-fourth of mankind. So think of... All of North America, no people. No people in Europe. No people in Africa. That's what's going to be wiped out by Antichrist in that time. That's tragic by itself. But you want to know what's worse than that? Six billion are going to hell. Two billion of us are going to be going to the, into the presence of the Lord, but six billion people are going to hell. Now, I may, there may be a lot of people on earth that I have met that I absolutely do not like. Absolutely do not like. And um, would not feel necessarily broken hearted if something tragic happened to them because of how despicable and how evil that they are. But even as they are that evil, I would never even put hell upon them. I would never wish for them the suffering that's going in hell. To my worst enemy, as they say, I would never wish that. Six billion people are going to be turned over to that. Now, that assignment to the six billion people belongs to us. That assignment belongs to the believers. God's not asking anything from the unbelievers. He's asking for, for our testimony in the earth to those who don't know Jesus. Now, you stop and you think what your personal responsibility is and why... If you think that there's 8 billion people, right, on the earth right now, it took 16 billion to make the 8 billion, right? Because it takes a husband and wife thing, you know. <laughs> so there you got 16 billion to make 8 billion. If you start it from the time of Adam and you roll this thing all the way through, you have to ask yourself a question. Why are you born now in this generation and why did God and you weren't an accident but why did God sovereignly pick you now to live now at this time because that's an assignment that he's given to us to reach six billion people and the way we do that is each person needs to fully saturate in the sphere of life that God has given to them how many people do you know in your sphere that don't know Jesus that need to be testified to. It's not up to you to bring them into the kingdom. That belongs to God. It's not up to you to make sure they understand the truth. That belongs to God. That's the Lord's responsibility. It's not yours. You cannot make anybody understand the truth. But God needs a proclamator. He needs a testifier. He needs a testimony. He needs a witness. And he'll take it from there what he's going to do. But that's what's required of us. And so we can't afford to keep our mouths shut. We can't afford to think to ourselves, to the people who don't want to hear anything about Jesus, we can't afford to not say something even when they say, I don't want to hear about this. Because we see a fate worse than we can comprehend, something that you would not wish upon them no matter how they would mistreat you. Because that's the compassion of our Father. And we're to mimic the heart of our Father. We're to mimic His love. We're to mimic His mercy and grace. Look past the problem of the individual and reach into their future with a testimony of Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit will do with that what He's going to do. But silent mouths do not speak. And witnesses that say nothing are not witnesses. And God has called us to be a witness and a testimony to those people that we can touch. The waiter in the, in the, in the hotel 
the person that you're going to bump into in the grocery line, if you're on an ever ready position and state of mind as a primary in life to be a witness of Jesus Christ, then you will stand guard, stand ready, and when the opportunity comes, you want to think, and go, oh, I think I should say something. It's not mechanical like that. It's a natural flow. Amen? So this is our time right now to rise and shine. That's what we're supposed to do. And I'm going to call a few things into mind here as we could do this. So Isaiah says this, Arise and shine. Man, I'm talking to this generation. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon us, or you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and darkness of the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, his, and his glory will appear upon you. That is you. That's to the nation of Israel. But it's a dual truth. It's a, it's a double interpretation, double application. Because obviously, quite honestly, Israel is an anti-Semitic. I mean, it's not anti-Semitic, excuse me, anti-Christ. They don't receive, they believe in the Messiah, but they don't receive Jesus Christ. They reject Jesus. There's a few that don't. Some of the Messianic Jews don't. But Israel as a whole rejects Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So God's not looking to Israel. He did. He's got the Messiah came from the Jews. We owe that to the Jews. That's, an, that's a debtedness that the Gentiles will forever owe the Jewish people. But Israel itself will be destroyed during the, during the time of Revelation. And God is extracting a people out of the Jews, the 144,000. It's going to be the first fruits of Israel by which he will start a Messianic Jewish nation again. That is not now. That's in the future. Although, praise God, some Jews are getting the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. So this applies to Israel, but it applies to us at the same time. And primarily to the Gentiles, because there's not enough of the Jewish people that have covered the earth that are Messianic that have a testimony of Jesus. Not enough of them. But there is in the world of the Gentile people. So this can apply both to Jew and both to Gentile at the same time. And what's going to happen is that God is going to visit us with the glory of his glory to open up our mouth and to be a testimony in the glory of God as we shine before the world. But you know what? You can shine and say nothing. I want to hear an interesting story. A battleship, British warship, is on a collision with another ship. And so he signals, click, 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 signal, and says, uh, suggest you change course, we're on a direct line of collision. And uh, the light, light says, suggest you change course. So they're having this little flicker light back and forth, you know, of the light uh, code, code. And finally the, the battleship, the captain of the battleship says, change light, change your course immediately. We are a British warship. He said, change your course immediately. I'm a, I'm a lighthouse on the rocks. <laughs> Now, as you stop and you think about how, if you say nothing, if you, then you get nothing. And we're to be an answerable light. We're to be a light of testimony in the midst of the night. No matter what the contest is that's facing us, we can't shut down. So this is an interesting perspective on a thousand years as a day ratio. Right now, based on that thousand days, a thousand days is the same as a year. Excuse me, a thousand years is a day, and a day is a thousand years. And it's in the book of Peter. And Jesus died 62 hours ago. From the eyes of God looking upon man, the freshness of perspective of time, Jesus would have only died 62 hours ago. And Adam was alive six days ago. This is interesting. So the end times is only 2,595 days long. It takes, in God's perspective, four hours from the time he starts it to the time he completes it. If a thousand years is as a day. A man 80 years old will have lived 46 minutes. That's for him to get his entire life and the testimony of Christ and the things that God would want him to do. A man 40 years old will live 23 minutes and a man 20 years old will live 11 and a half minutes. And you stop and you think about how God looks at time, and you think, wow, it's just going to take forever. But as, as far as the Lord, look how fresh the crucifixion of Christ is from heaven's perspective. It's only 62, so it's only 62 hours old. That's not even three days. That's the freshness of time as it's braced in that moment. Look at this. Each minute that passes by in your life is equal to 10.65 10, 10 days. 
That's amazing. Each year is one point. Each hour is a, is one one and three quarters of a year, or a year and two hundred and seventy four days. Every from the perspective of life that God looks at us, and that's why Psalm says that our life is like uh, like dust. It's like a flower in the field, and the winds blow over it and it erases it, and it is no more. Do you remember people like my father died in two thousand eighteen? I think about him often, but. If you drive by my father's house, no one thinks about that. Because we're here, we're as, as dust, we are just a flower in the field in a season, and then we're gone. But why is God so interested in our flash moment? Why is he so interested in the little short time that we have on this earth from our perspective of God? Why is he so intense with us in the flash of our moment before we go to dust? Because he loves us. Because what we do here has a great bearing on the rewards we get there. And the Lord will remember everything, that he, uh, this flash moment of our lives. That's the intensity by which he cares for us. Romans, in 56 AD, Paul said this. The night is almost gone and the day is near. In 56 AD, Paul wrote this. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now stop and think about this. In 61 AD, he wrote the book of Philippians. And he said, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. This is 2023, as you well know. He wrote that in 61. Look at this. James wrote in 50 AD, you too be patient, strengthening your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. You know, these are foundation apostles, folks that wrote the, the urgency of the return of Jesus Christ in their generation. Peter wrote in 63 AD, The end of all things is near, therefore be of sound judgment, sober spirit, for the purpose of prayer. I'll explain something here in just a second. In 96 AD, when Revelation was written, it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things for which are written in it, for the time is near. And then it closes it out, and it says, And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. In Acts chapter 2, in the day of Pentecost, as Peter reads the book of Joel out of 2.28 in the Old Testament, but he quotes that prophecy, he said, for it shall be in the latter days. The latter days began on the day of Pentecost, after they wrote their letters. Uh, 96 AD wasn't written yet, of course. But here we are in 2023, and we say, well, why are they saying that Jesus is near in their, in their letters when here it is 2023 and Jesus hasn't come yet? Well, Peter says this, know this first of all, then the last days mocker, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep and continues just, all things continue just as it did from the beginning of creation. And so there's a sleepiness. Listen to this. When Jesus makes his explanation on Monday, Sunday, April 7, 32 AD, on the Mount of Olives, and he's giving his explanation from starting Matthew 23 all the way to the end of the 25th chapter of Matthew, he includes in that the parable of the ten virgins. And of that ten virgins, he said all ten were sleeping when the, when the groom came. All ten were sleeping. Which suggests that there's an apathy element, a complacency element, and an indifference element in this generation about the seriousness of the return of Jesus Christ. But it also tells us through scripture, be vigilant, be awake. Because Satan walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. And let us not sleep as some do, or those that at night run in the crowd, but let us be awake for we are of the day. That's what the scripture tells us in Thessalonians. So you and I need to understand some things here about the responsibility that we're facing. And we, as Paul said to Timothy, no soldier that is enlisted in an army entangles himself with the daily affairs of this life. So you have to stop and think. We have to, we've got to earn an income. We've got to pay rent. We've got to put gas in our tanks. We have to buy food. We have to buy clothes. We have to pay for different various bills. So the Lord isn't saying working. In fact, it says in Scripture... It says, if a man won't work, then he shouldn't eat. So we have to work. We know that. We have our daily routines and things that we have to do. That's what we've got to do. But whatever we do, it needs to be an avocation, not the vocation. The vocation is our testimony in Christ. 
So if we go to work and do the things that we do, then we need to bear witness about Christ in all the things that we do in work. In other words, we ought to put out the best product in the world. We ought to be the most honest people. Everything we ought to do ought to be done with excellence. We ought to leave a trail mark of excellence in everywhere we go and a fragrance of Christ in every place that we leave. We need to leave that. And that's a testimony of Christ as well. Look on here. John says, Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And he's asking about this deal about the truth. And Jesus said, You say correctly that I'm a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now follow along with me on this. Jesus wouldn't answer him anything. He kept asking him questions. He says, Don't you know that it's, your life is in my hands? And he turns to him and says, You have no authority except what's been given to you from heaven. But this is the longest explanation he will give to Herod. Excuse me, not Herod, but, but to Pilate. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. What is truth? Now listen to me very carefully as we trail this thing through. Um, the requirement of truth in this generation and the thing that God requires of us individually, which is not necessarily comfortable. Okay? I'm going to tell you straight up, it takes courage to face truth sometimes. Doesn't take too much courage. Let me tell you what faithfulness is. Faithfulness, being proven faithful, is not when you get to do something that you enjoy doing and you have no problem sacrificing everything to do that. Let me tell you what faithful is. Faithful is when you show up doing something you don't want to do. When you're there because you don't necessarily want to be. When all the odds are against you and everything, and you're doing it anyway, that's called faithfulness. Faithfulness isn't because you get to do something you like to do. It's because you show up consistent on the things that you don't want to do. A faithful person is marked out by God. Blessed is he who swears, who fulfills his own vows to his own hurt. If he said he'll do it, even if he doesn't want to do it, he'll do it. That's called being faithful, full of faith. In other words, you know how to set your priorities, and you know how to make your sacrifices. You know what I'd rather be right now? On my motorcycle, cruising through the mountain or fishing. You bet. That would be delightful to me. But that would, not, that would be an act of unfaithfulness when I'm supposed to be on Sunday meeting with the Fellowship of the Saints. So that's an unfaithful act to me. Although heaven's not going to close up, the earth isn't going to shatter, the poles aren't going to collapse. But being faithful to the Lord is to be consistent to the right thing to do at all times. So look what it says here. To love the truth is to love God's character. God is truth. Alright, follow me now on this. Now here we go, watch this. Those who, who love the Lord will hear His voice. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Those three things. God is never going to change His character. He says, behold, Israel says, you, I, I, you are not destroyed because I don't change. Because He is full of mercy, grace, and love. That's true. So everything that God does of His love, now watch how this works. Out of His love comes His mercy. And out of His mercy comes His grace. But the character of God is a multifaceted, but the descriptions of God is righteous, and His character is love. That's why Ephesians says, speak the truth in love. You have to speak the, the word of the Spirit, which is His truth, and the Spirit of His word, which is His character, which is love. So speaking the accuracy of His word in the character of who He is, is the combination that makes the effect work. That's what it is. In love, we say things that are difficult to say. In love, we have to speak the truth. It's not love when you withhold the truth or you're intimidated, you don't love the truth. You, you love yourself, you're covering yourself because you don't want to be embarrassed to have to tell the truth. Or you don't want to experience the reprisals that come against you for telling the truth. But to tell the truth at your own hurt is to follow the character of God, which is love. To speak the truth in love. Amen? So follow that through with me on this one. 2 Thessalonians says, the Antichrist will come 
and with all deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive, look at this, the love of the truth so as to be saved. You know why they didn't see the love of the truth? Watch this. Love is serving others at the cost of self. Lust is serving self at the cost of others. So if you're a lust-based person, you're always self-covering in a very selfish way because if truth costs you something, you're not going to say it or you're not going to follow it. And that's why one of the parables of the seed is the person who receives the truth and then it produces persecution. And because of the persecution, he falls away from the truth. Why? Because it cost him something and he didn't love the truth. But to walk in the truth is to walk in such a way that even if it costs you something, you have an allegiance, a moral obligation to the truth. And if you're a person who is that way, then you are loving the character of God. And God can trust you. Listen to this now. He can trust you with power if you love the truth. Because that same truth will bring conviction to you to change. That same truth will contrast where you're deficient. That same truth will come to you when you aren't mar hitting the mark quite right. And now you have to square up with truth and face the mirror in truth. And God says, you know what? You're deficient in this area. He's never going to say it to you with condemnation. But he is going to say it to you in the mirror of his word. And says, I'm going to show you something. He holds up this mirror of his word. Here's his righteousness and you're missing it. It's a flaw in your character. It's where Christ isn't present. It's where Christ is demanding change. It's where truth has got to come in. And you've got to get up your patterned, reflexive mind th thoughts. The way you always think, the way you always saw something, the way you always viewed something. I refuse to change on that. That's the truth and that's the way it's going to be. Sorry, Bubba, but you just missed it again. <laughs> Because the truth is now trying to get in and bring some alignment and correction. And you've got to change your pattern, mind reflexes that just take place. And so when truth comes in, as I said at the beginning, it takes courage to face truth. It takes courage for you to admit, I need to reconsider this. It takes courage for you to, to make an alignment. And, and we are only changed by truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. To where you don't face square with the truth, you are in bondage. If you don't square with the truth that God is trying to show you, then you remain limited. If you don't square with the truth, you can't come into your freedom. Freedom and the truth will always produce a prosperity of advancements and promotions in the kingdom. And when you don't square up with it in your character, and you're afraid to admit it, you're held back. And you're retarded in that area. You're deficient. In that area. And the more stubborn you are, the more the heat comes up. Listen to me. With every area that you do not have truth, there is mercy and grace in the mix of it right now as, as, as an, act, an act of God preserving you while you do not operate in the truth. Absent of that mercy, judgment's coming. And when you resist the truth long enough, then God just slides back and pulls back the grace and the mercy until you start to experience what the bondage of non-truth is. And you go, why is this happening to me? How come this is taking place? What's going on? It's because you're living in an area where there's not truth, where the Lord wants to bring you into truth so that you can have freedom and overcome, which requires a change in character and you to be more Christ-like in an area that you're not giving Him the credit in. Amen. Slap yourself. <laughs> All right, look at 2 Thessalonians again. For this reason, Paul will send upon them... A deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. Because they get given over to it. They didn't have the love of the truth. They didn't follow the love of the truth. So they're given over to this deception. In order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Now folks, listen to what I'm saying to you. Truth the headwaters of truth is God. There is one only exclusive source to truth which disseminates from there and that is the Lord God Almighty. It is His standard, His righteousness, His truth by which all men now focus upon without deviation say, that's truth. So, a person comes by and says, well, 
I want to change that because I don't think, I, I think a man can be a woman and he can identify with being a woman. Therefore, that's the new truth. Yeah. But we know by moral, the word of God, that a man is a man and a woman is a woman and the twain shall never cross. I don't care how much mutilation surgery you go through. It doesn't make any difference. You're still going to be what you are. When you leak blood all over the ground because someone cut you, that genetic code will come back as a male or a female. It won't come back surgically modified. <laughs> it won't be that way. Because that is the truth. And so we're living in an hour right now where everybody wants to modify truth. And truth actually is what God says. He's the headwaters of truth that will never change. So when people, watch this now. So you and I, we're guilty of this. When you and I face up, when we have the areas in our life where the light of Christ has not shined, where we're not matured in the truth, or we don't know the truth, or we haven't realized the revelation of that, where that's not shining, we're operating in a non-truth in our life, and we are in limitation in that area. You may be soaring like eagles in other areas, but this one area, a lack of faithfulness, a compromise, a choice, afraid to make the sacrifice, to do the right thing of what it would cost you to do the right thing, compromising 1% every single day, it's that 1% factor, you compromise, you compromise, you compromise, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, and at the end of six months, you've got about 500% compromises going on. What's going on? You're not allowing truth in that area. You're not changing in that area. You're retarded in that area. You're held back in that area. There's no life in that area. There's no promotion in that area. There's nothing but liability in that area. And God wants you to change. And he's committed to you to bring change. He's going to do that. And so he just pulls back the grace and the mercy. Where the enemy said, I want to get to them, but you've got grace and mercy over their life, and I can't get to them. God says, you're right, because I'm working with them. But if they don't want to listen to me, then I'll let you have a percentage of that. And so the enemy comes in. He goes, thank you, I'll take that little percentage you give me. And then all of a sudden things start to happen. Oh God, how could this happen to me? Why is this taking place like this? What's going on? All the while, the Lord hasn't abandoned you. He's standing ready. And we'll get to that here in a second. This is exactly what he'll do. Here it is. Matthew 5 says, For the blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So you're never going to get to that place, poor in spirit, until the heat goes on. Until you're willing to square up with God and be honest with the Lord. You know what? This poor in spirit, this de deficit I have, this lack of the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ that should be in my life in this area is lacking. And we've ignored it and ignored it and ignored it and played with it and had pleasure in, in sin or whatever it may be or lack of control or the lack of the fruit of the spirit in that area, temperance, whatever it may be, love, joy, peace, whatever it may be, we're lacking in that area. And God says, don't worry. I which began the good and work in you, I'll complete it until the day of Christ, Philippians 1 6. But I got here, here's an option. I always say to my kids when they're growing up, you can learn by the burn or you can learn by wisdom. You know what? Behold, God will complete you unto the day of Jesus Christ. He which began the good work in you, he will complete it unto the day of Christ. Your choice is how much pain or less pain you want to go through to get that completion. Because he's committed to completing you. Now, you can go with him, or you can go against him. You can be Miss Egomaniac all the way through. You know it all. No one can teach you. No one can. You've got your pattern reflex of mind thoughts going. You've got established patterns. You've got perspectives of Scripture. And it's not working. Because you lack the revelation in that area of, the, of God's Word. It's not academics that's going to get you going forward, folks. Listen to me very carefully, and I'll say it very clearly to you. A person with a revelation is never at the mercy of a person with academic understanding. A person who is mired in ap academic understanding, who does not have the revelation of the word of the truth, is not free. They don't know the truth. They can recite the truth, they can speak scripture, they can memorize scripture, but lacking the revelation of that, Ephesians 1.17, where it says that the eyes of your understanding be open to the wisdom of our Father and the revelation of who He is. 
So when you're reading God's word and you're looking at it academically, you're looking at it religiously, you're looking at it denominationally, you're looking at it historically, you're looking at pattern mind, mind reflexes, you're looking at the way you've always looked at it, you don't know the truth. You're looking at, you're looking at information that you, can't have, that you don't have a revelation to. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You shall gnosko the truth, intimacy with the truth. It means you will have the revelation of that truth and the revelation of that truth will produce the freedom in your life, not the academia. Amen. And we make that mistake. I've read the Bible five times, but yeah, but you've got enough revelation to put it into a thimble. It's not your academia that makes the difference. It's the revelation of that. Yeah. Now here's where we have these blind spots. The blind spots is when we don't submit to the revelation, to the word, and the truth starts to come to us, and we get a little nudge. You need to change this. Uh, you, need to, you need to tweak that up a little bit. That's called a conviction, not a condemnation. Conviction always has solution. Condemnation doesn't. And they can almost feel the same. And they can almost sound the same. They'll, they'll both tell you that you're wrong. But when you are led by the Spirit of God under conviction, it will bring you to a solution, which is a revelation of the Word that sets you free. When you cry out. So blessed are the poor in spirit. Do you, the navigation process that God gets to you to navigate you to this one place where you're no longer ignoring the truth but now you're finally holding the mirror before you and he says you are poor in spirit you are deficit in this area of your spiritual maturity in Jesus Christ you're deficit you're in debt you, you're, you're missing the mark you're going huh right now you don't feel the burn and the pain you just have the acknowledgement blessed are the poor in spirit for there's the kingdom of heaven he lets that stay now that he has shown you the truth, now what's your reaction to it? Is it, again, just mental acknowledgement? Is that all it is? Or does it bring to you a position where you now have to drive forward and say, well, Lord, that's not right. That needs to change. You see, listen to me. Humility will lower yourself and God will lift you up. Hear me clear, clearly on this. If you're not in a state right here where you factor in the humility, all you're going to do is going, huh, okay, I guess that's wrong. You're not humble. You haven't felt the burn yet. When you come to the burn, you'll be on your knees crying, oh God, help me. It'll change. You know, it's a lot easier just to stay in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, listen to his little nudges, listen to him touch you, listen to read the word, Acknowledge the changes that need to be made. Be courageous enough to stand in front of a mirror and say, God, I've missed it on this. I'm wrong. That's the express route to less pain. Although it may be intense, a punch in the face is a lot easier to take than broken ribs and concussion and broken bones and everything else that goes with it. I'm telling you, humble yourself before the hand of God and in due time He will lift you up by acknowledging the truth. So when he gets you to this place where you finally can acknowledge, blessed are the poor in spirit, you're saying, okay, God, um, you pulled back the mercy on me a little bit. You pulled back the grace on me. You haven't judged me to destruction, but you've let me see the consequence of the error of my ways. You've, you've, you've let me see this. And God looks at you and says, that's right. And I'm not condemning you in the process. He will pick you up. He will embrace you. He will love you. He say, I got a great plan for you. Come on, we're going to get through this. I got a great plan. I'm going to bring you through this storm, and you're going to come out on the other side as a champion and a winner and prospering and growing. Are you ready? And all you can do with the best strength you've got is can be in total, complete surrender. Jesus said this, apart from me, you can do nothing. When you surrender to that, that you're not your hero and you are not your solution that exclusively belongs to Jesus. When you finally surrender to that, you're on the express route to change. Blessed are those who mourn. That mourning period will have to stay there for a while.
You may acknowledge that you're deficit in spirit. You may acknowledge that you haven't quite made the mark yet. But until the heat of that starts to cook itself through and you have courageous enough to listen and be humble enough to admit you're wrong and motivated enough to want to change, hear that last part. Motivated enough to want to change. That morning, blessed are those who are mourned, you're going to be comforted, but let the mourning process, the burn, the regret, the grief, the godly sorrow, let that come in. If you're, not, if you're not ready to change yet, you're not in the morning state yet. You're not there. You're acknowledging you're wrong, but you're not in that. You have no motivation yet to change. So that mourning process is going to have to sift its way through. And it's going to be like burning coals that go right through the mattress. They just smolder, smolder, and keep burning down through the layers. That's the mourning process. It's not fun. It's a lot easier to humble yourself quickly when God shows you what's wrong. Humble yourself and say, God, what would you have me to do? And then get past these steps as quickly as possible. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's teachable now. Finally, you were poor in spirit. You recognized it. But you didn't probably get too much motivation for change right away until the mourning process finished its way through. Now, what is God doing to this generation? He's going to hold up the mirror. I'm going to tell you this next move of the Spirit. I'm going to tell you what He's going to do. And I'm telling you as clear as day, God is going to visit this generation with a massive overdose of mercy. Massive overdose of mercy. But He's going to show them how far off we've been. And when He does that, He's going to say, here's the mercy. Now, mercy, listen to this. Mercy doesn't save you. Mercy holds back the enemy from destruction so that you have time to change. Because in the absence of mercy, there is judgment. So please understand that. Mercy doesn't change you. It is holding the enemy back who wants to destroy you so that you exercise the option for change. You follow along with it, what I'm saying to you. So when we say God is merciful, be merciful, you're saying, Lord, give me time to change. Let me pay attention, Lord, to your spirit. God, hold back the destroyer. God, don't let this thing happen to me. Have mercy, O oh God, so that you can repent, so that you can change, so that you can embrace the fellowship of the spirit, so that you can read God's word and say, I choose to change, Lord. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now you're teachable. Now, finally, God has you in a place where you're saying, I will do whatever you want me to do. Now humility is to the forefront of your actions. Now in a state of humility, it's not about your ego anymore. It's not about what, how you're going to shine. It's about one thing. I am humble to the feet of Jesus. What would you have me to do? And then he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they're going to be satisfied. And that begins the process of change. Verse 6 now starts the revelation. You're hungering, you're thirsting for righteousness. What are you doing? You're humbling yourself before the Lord. And remember, it's the truth that sets you free, but the righteousness of God is truth, and truth sets you free. So when you get before the Lord, you say, Father, i got to change. He says, do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Because if you're going to change, you got to stop that. Or you need to fill, you need to have the exchange. Give me that liability. Jesus says, give it to me. Give it to me. Give me, give me your, your lust. Give it to me. I'll give you my righteousness. Give me this thing that's, that's eating you up on the inside. And I'll give you my righteousness. I'll give you my strength. I'll, I'll cause there to be change. I, my spirit will change you from within. I'm the one who does it. You can't do it. You don't have the ability to save yourself here. But I do. I can give you that ability. I'm Jesus Christ. Here comes the Lord showing up. He's going to take your liability. Everything in the kingdom is by an exchange process. You give him the liability, he gives you his righteousness. You give him your sin, he gives you forgiveness. You give him your deficit, he gives you your strength. Everything's an exchange process through Jesus Christ. And it's a process that we continue to walk through as we grow in Christ from glory to glory to glory to glory, strength to strength, grace to grace, faith to faith. That's what he does. It's an exchange process. Here's the problem. We, our worst enemy, 
that, fa that we face is not Satan, it's us. We're the ones who makes that choice. Now, Satan can't stop truth coming to you. You want to know why? He says he'll try to steal it from your heart. But how does he steal the Holy Spirit who is the tr spirit of truth living in you? He doesn't. He can't stop the voice of God from speaking, so he tries to stop you from hearing. He doesn't stop the voice of God's truth coming into you. He just distracts you away from it. All of his strategies have to center upon you because he can't stop God. So when the Lord makes an entry into your life to change you, to strengthen you, to bless you, to promote you, to honor you, and to lift you up above the storm, and to bring you into freedom from bondage, and to heal you from disease, and whatever it may be, doesn't make any difference what it is, He's got a plan for you for good things. He has a plan for your deliverance, a plan for your prosperity, a plan for every single thing. He's got it for you in every single dimension of your life. You can't think of one where God hasn't covered the deficit or the problem that you're walking in, except that He has an answer for you. But it requires that you have to acknowledge Him and you have to love Him more than you love your lust. One of the two. Because the two can't coexist. It's a surrender to your lust and an embracing of God's love, His righteousness, His truth, His change. Here comes courage. God, this has got to change in my life, whatever it may be. And we're all working on it. And here's even worse news. We're all working on multiple areas at the same time. Not just one thing. So when we get this hunger and thirst for righteousness, then we're going to change. Now watch this. Here's your deception and your delays. The gifts of the Spirit tell us all is well. It's not. I'm talking about being used of God. You prophesy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. God used you to heal somebody. Whatever it may be. Gifts never endorse character. It proves the power of God, but it doesn't prove anything else upon you. God makes donkeys talk. He makes rocks cry out, and it has nothing to do with character. So, though God may use you, and thank God He does, because if God had to wait for perfect people, the gospel would never get preached, and no gifts of the Spirit would ever operate. But you cannot use those gifts as your endorsement. I don't care if, if it's Mr. Who's Who up on the platform and people are being healed and delivered and everything else and you're calling out words of knowledge. This person over here coming out, getting healed. And that person, and massive salvations come to the altar. That's all the gifts of the Spirit. And you can be a complete donkey in, your, in the fruits of the Spirit, totally bankrupt. Why is God doing that? Because he, the gifts of the Spirit operate from the fruits of the Spirit, unique, separate, and different. Keep that in mind. Your gifting never endorses you as an approval of God. It's the fruits of the Spirit that endorse you in the approval of God. Amen. Keep that in mind. It's self-deceptive to think, look at me, Mr. Big Two-Shoes, coming up here. Want to see the gifts of the Spirit operate? Well, you're known for this. You're known for healing. You're known for raising the dead. You're known for this. Yep, that's me. But in your private life, you're complete bankrupt. It doesn't work that way. And people eventually will see it. There will be a, a, a glitch in the spirit, in the testimony of spirit to spirit, when a person operates in power, but you know that there's something wrong in the character. Big time. And until that person changes, quits using a masquerade, quits using a veneer as their endorsement, as their validation, and they start saying transparently in humility, yeah, God uses me in different things, but the Lord's also working on me. Because we're all there. Amen? Amen? We're all chickens in the same barnyard. We're all sheep in the same pasture. We have one shepherd, his name is Jesus, and no sheep owns another sheep. So gifts... Tell us all is well, and it's not true. The gifts don't do that. Donkeys talk, rocks cry out, you get to speak. Not a whole lot of difference in that lineup. 
Okay, we have time. When do you want to change? When do you decide you want to change? I got time. No, you don't. Because if you think you have time, watch God pull back, because he's on a time schedule with you, by the way. He wrote a book, and all the days were put in that book, when as yet there was not one of them. He wrote them about your life. Psalm 139, 16, 17 talks about that. So you're on a timeline with the Lord, whether you realize it or not. And God says, you know what? I will complete it under the day of Jesus Christ. That means from where you're at now to the completion of the day of Jesus Christ, there are some timelines in there. And the easier, the quicker that you submit to the Lord and humble yourself, the more consistent you can be in that timeline. The more faithful, consistent standard you are being beyond that timeline. So you don't have all the time you want. That's why the scripture says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't mean work out being saved. Remember, there's 22 benefits to salvation. Work out the process of all salvation gives to you with fear and trembling. Work out the process of that salvation that you've come into Christ with that incorruptible seed and then walk out that process as that seed expands and grows inside of you and that you become more and more like Christ day by day in your character, in your attitude, in your answers, in your honesty, in your dealings, in your relationships. Work that process out with fear and trembling as before the Lord. Who will God talk to? Who will God listen to? The Bible says, He who trembles at my word. God means what He says. His word will never fail. And if you think that God has, is not fulfilling His word, you're misunderstanding something. He will fulfill His word, but the Lord is buffering the fulfillment with mercy and grace until that judgment comes. Please understand that. He is going to fulfill his word. God is not mocked. What a person sows, he's going to reap. So let's start sowing the right thing. So that we can reap the right thing. Let's start doing the thing that God wants us to do so we can come into our blessings. The, the, the ceasing or the holding back of our blessings, God is anxious to bless us, to promote us, to increase us, to get us past those things that harass you. To get you past those limitations that are constantly bothering you. God doesn't like it when his children are bothered by their own failures. He doesn't like that. He loves you. He wants you past that limit that keeps harassing and dogging you all the time. And the thing that's going to set you free is his truth. And if you bring it to the Lord, he is, you'll never come into the presence of our Father with him condemning you. He's not going to look at you like this. What do you want? Well, Father, I need to change. I've been talking to you about that. Come back later. I'm a little bit mad at you right now. That's not the way the Lord is. The moment you confess that sin and come before his presence, he's willing to embrace, embrace you and says, okay, let's talk about the pathway. This can be a lot less painful than you're making it. Let's talk about the pathway. Self-deserving self -deserving endorsements. Boy, do we ever use those a lot to be self-validated. To do everything we can to make sure that everything looks like we're standing in good light. And when we're not. And so we look for everybody else's endorsements, everybody else's validation. We get up there and we dance and we make, hey, I'm okay, look at me. We use gifts for endorsement. We, we operate in the gifts of the Spirit for endorsement, for our own ego. We pinch at the glory of God, exploiting Jesus by the gifts He's given to us so that we can make ourselves look better in a light standing when it's really not true. And it's an attitude of our hearts. Don't stop being used by God. Don't stop being used in the Spirit by the Lord. Don't stop doing that because you're struggling in overcoming something. But don't use it as your covering. And don't use it as your validation. And don't use it as something that you need to push out to the front and say, everybody look at me. See me? How am I doing, guys? I look pretty good? Yeah, but let's get past the paper tiger and see what's on the other side. It's not that way. Folks, we're, everybody in this church... It's like everybody else in this church. There's not an exception to that one rule. The pastor is just like everybody else. Struggle, sin, need to overcome. And the emphasis isn't sin. The, the emphasis is our Father and what He's going to do with us. And how He's going to complete us. How He's going to raise us up. How He's going to move us forward. That's the emphasis. 
And we all are gifted, we're all anointed, we're all called, we've all been chosen by the Lord. We're all here. We're all together. Who, who's going to point at who? Who's going to judge anybody else in here? Nobody gets to judge anybody because we're all in the process going to the same direction. But sometimes people lag, lag, and sometimes they spin out of the out of the out of the, the sheep, the pasture, and they start playing out there on the fringes. That's where the wolves patrol, by the way. Sheep look like one big mass to a wolf when they go. You know what the defensive sheep is? They move closer together. And they look like one unit. And the wolf goes, do I or don't I? Hey, but wait, I see one lone snowflake out here. It's hanging on the edge outside. That's vulnerability. They're not connected to the fellowship of the flock. Hmm. Come on, boys, there'll be mutton tonight. And that's what happens. Finally, earning by labors. We think that we're better because we work harder. Don't do that. Your labors does not prove your relationship. Let me say it this way. Never invert your sonship with your servanthood. Never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever, ever do that. You are first a son or a daughter before God, before you are a servant of anything. And never invert that. I'm going to do more for my father. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to do more. I'm going to do more. I'm going to work harder. Oh, God, are you happy with me yet? I'm going to read more. I'm going to pray more. God, are you happy with me yet? It's never going to be works that's going to give you your relationship. The father isn't raising slaves. He's raising sons and daughters. Never invert that. The prodigal son came running back with a speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your servants. He had, he had forsaken his own sonship and took on a lower form as a servant. Although Paul said that he was a bondservant. Yes, you can be a bondservant in the attitude of your labors and sacrifices before Father. But he did not emphasize his works. He emphasized his sonship with the Father as a bondservant. So hear what I'm saying to you. Don't ever invert the things that you do for God as more important than the things that you do with God. What you do with God becomes the quality of what you'll do for God. And so you have got to be as a, you have to recognize my Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. You recognize him as this is my Father. And, and the Father says, I'm not raising a household of slaves. I don't need that. I don't need labors for the kingdom. I've got myriads of angels doing that. I raise sons and daughters whom I love, whom I pour forth with all my heart. And that's what I want. Now stop and ask yourself, what's your primary objective here? What is that? Stop and think. We're in a flash pan moment of life and God gives you gifts so that you can lay hands on the sick, they'll be healed. So that you can cast out devils that are oppressing people, possessing people. So that you can raise the dead who have died, stolen life before their appointed time. So you can do the miracles, preach the gospel, see people come rushing into Christ. Okay? But that is not your primary. That's not your primary. That's the works that you do for our Father. Why? Because you're of the truth in a generation that lacks truth. You're the steady, solid, unchanging, embracing that truth, steady and solid. Listen to me carefully. Your primary objective from which all things will flow. Your primary objective, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your soul. That's what you're supposed to do. And out of that, you will maintain your sonship. And then out of that, you will know what to do for the Father. But you forget loving the Father with all your mind, all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. You forget that part, and you put works to the front. What can I do for you today? I'm just checking in. What can I do for you today? Well, then you sound like the Ephesian church. The Ephesian church in the book of Revelation says, I know your labors, your perseverance, your toils, your struggles. 
how you test those who say they're apostles and are not. But I have this against you. You left your first love. And if you don't stop and repent and do the things you did at first, this is what he said. He says, I'll remove the candlestick. That's the illumination and the glory of God in the church. He says, I'll remove it. Why? Because I have no desire to raise a church that doesn't love me. I have no desire to fill a church where there's no love of God in it. Your primary is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, heart, soul, mind, strength, and spirit. Now watch this. And if you love Him with that much strength, when He comes to you and says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, what can I do for you, Father? I want to repent. Instead of standing in different... Yeah, I know, but you know, marijuana is really not all that bad. I mean, it's not as bad as alcohol. And actually, it's legal. So, you know, it's really not that bad, Lord. And I think that we could go ahead and, and go ahead with marijuana anyway. Oh, because it's actually herb of the field and you made it. And so we have all these excuses and things of rationale. And we are insensitive to the Holy Spirit saying, don't do that. If you love him more than you love yourself, then you're inclined to say, God, if you ask me to change, I'll change. If you want me to do different, I'll do different. And how we do that... We start with humility. Humility empowers you. This now, this is the first part of this message. It's almost finished. <laughs> humility empowers you to set aside your self-endorsement so that you can, it should be can, receive the truth without the motivation of promotion and self-validation. The most powerful servant you'll ever meet is a man of great humility. There are two men that I can tell you in the scripture that are the most humble. The first is Jesus Christ, who made of himself no reputation. The second is Moses. God said Moses was the most humble man on earth in that time. Humility is powerful. Humility is nuclear. Humility breaks down every wall. Humility makes you transparent. Humility takes away self-endorsement. Humility removes you from self-promotion. Humility removes you from a self-aggrandizement. Humility removes you from the demand that other people recognize you. Humility puts you right on ground where God's at. Jesus was not afraid to hang out with the sinners and everybody the Pharisees rejected. He went to their homes. He stood by the woman who was caught in adultery. Caught in the very act, which means that she probably might not have been dressed, but likely she was because she was with Pharisees. But if she was, it was scantily clad. And when Jesus said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, he didn't move from her proximity. He stayed next to her side. The missus would have gotten him. Humility is when a woman can come into a meeting, weep over your feet, dry your feet with her hair, and then anoint you with perfume until that perfume fills the whole room. And then a Pharisee says, well, if he was really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this was that's touching him. Humility lets you do that and not retract your feet. Pride would make you pull your feet back. Jesus was the most humble man on the earth. And the second one recorded in scripture is Moses. And to this day, Moses stands to the forefront as the iconic prophet of the Jewish nation. And Jesus stands to the forefront who said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go and make disciples of all nations. And that's what we're to do in our labors. But the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your power. And then when you come before the Father with all those issues of all the failures, of all the deficiencies, of all the habits, of all the regrets, of all the brokenness, He embraces you, He loves you, He kisses you, and He infuses you with His light and His glory, and then you are free. And that's what our Father does. So let's love Him with all of our heart. Let's love Him with all of our heart. 
And we take that back to the first slide that says, rise and shine for the glory of the Lord is going to come upon you. Because we're the ones that are going to go to six billion people, not in weakness, not as still trying to overcome, but as overcomers who can testify to the power of God's truth, light, love, His embracing of us without condemnation. Amen? Amen. So stand up, punch the person in the shoulder next to you, and say blessings to you. <laughs> Okay, just greet each other with a holy kiss. <laughs> I'm speaking scripture. <laughs> okay, that was culture. We're not in the culture. <laughs> Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. You are so committed to us. Father, we praise you and we thank you for that. And Lord, I ask for your blessings upon the folks here. You are the one who finishes us. Lord, there's no one here ahead of anybody. Lord, there's nobody here, Father, that can stand alone like Jesus did. Sinless. So, Father, we turn our hearts and eyes to you. We ask you for forgiveness. Father, infuse us with your truth. Infuse us, Lord, that we can change. Father, we, I pray, Lord, that we just avoid the burn because we have spurned wisdom. And help us, Father, to humble ourselves before your mighty hand to walk into this so that change may have its process in us and that we can be as one who testifies to the grace and glory of your mighty, glorious Son, Jesus. So this day, Father, I ask that you bless them and you keep them. Make your face shine upon them. Lord, be gracious unto them. Lift up your face, your countenance upon us, Lord. Wow. Lord, and shine upon us in that way. And give us peace as we go in and go out. Break into the dungeons of our darkness. Break into our limitations. Break into our confusion. Break in, Father, to our need. Change our mind where we have learned to accept defeat. Father, I pray, change our mind to rise up to an overcome. Whatever it may be, sickness disease, habits, whatever it may be. You've not condemned us. Give us peace to rise up to a higher standard in your name. And we give you the glory, the praise, and the thanks for all this, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. See you tonight, 6 o'clock.